Hi, welcome to True Creeps, where the stories are true and the creeps are real. We'll cover stories from grotesque gore to the possibly plausible paranormal, to horrifying history, to tense and terrible true crime, and everything else that goes bump in the night. We're your hosts, Amanda. And I'm Lindsay. And we want you to join us while we creep. We cover mature topics. Listener discretion is advised. Hello, everyone. Today, we are going to be discussing the tragic murders of Judith Barcy and her mother, Maria. If Judith's name sounds familiar to you, it's because she was a child actor in the 80s. And you've probably seen at least one project that she's been in. I feel like this is like our childhood, right? Like our age range. Oh, absolutely. The second one that you're going to say in a moment really hit my soul very deeply. Yes. So she was the voice of Anne Marie in All Dogs Go to Heaven, the voice of Ducky in Land Before Time, Thea in Jaws, The Revenge, and then a few smaller roles. And again, this is just a few of them. She's been in more things, but a few smaller roles. She was in Growing Pains, The Love Boat, Punky Brewster, and Cheers. Her voice is very clear in my head. And then as you're researching, we were listening to clips of her as well. And it was just like, oh, heartbreaking. Just so heartbreaking. Yeah. So this is a tough case to cover because it does involve child abuse and both physical and emotional abuse. So just wanted to put that out there at the beginning for everyone. Also, my voice is a little off because I'm coming back from the flu. So if I sound a little strange, that's why. (laughs) We all get sick. Constantly. I've been sick, I don't know how many episodes, even this year. (laughs) I feel like I'm a little extra raspy. My voice is a little deeper than typically. Not that I have a high voice generally, but you get what I'm saying. You sound great. Thanks. So, of course, we always want to focus on the victim's life, not just the worst thing that happened to them. So Judith Eva Barcy was born on June 6, 1978 in Los Angeles, California, to her parents, Maria Agnes Veravatz. Barsi and Joseph Barsi. Both of her parents immigrated from Hungary after fleeing the 1956 uprisings, and both unfortunately grew up with abuse. The two had met in California in a restaurant where Maria worked in 1976, and they hit it off and ended up getting married in August of 1977. For both of them, this was their second marriage. After having Judith, Maria quit her job to become a stay at home mom. Meanwhile, Joseph was struggling, and he was struggling to find employment. And so at this time, they were living in a small apartment, and they were on welfare. So Maria had always admired Hollywood and all the movie stars, which I mean, especially living in California. So after she had Judith, she really wanted to help her get a career in acting. She started to help Judith learn about posture and poise as she was learning how to speak. So she started preparing her when she's just two years old. Joseph Weldon, Maria's brother, told her that, you know, the chances are slim that she's going to succeed in this goal. It's one in 10,000, make it. But she did, Mm -hmm. right? Which is amazing. And so Judith was originally first spotted at an ice rink by a crew that was there to film a commercial. At the time, she was about five, but the casting agent thought that she was three because she was tiny, which I would actually imagine really helped her because she was able to act like a five-year-old, but look like she's three. Yes. She could take lines differently. Yeah. And so the agent approached Maria with an acting opportunity for Judith. And her first commercial aired shortly after, and that was for Donald Duck orange juice, which I can vividly taste. Yes, yes. And you taste it. Can you see the commercial in your head? Yeah. So one source mentioned that throughout Judith's career, she booked a total of 72 commercials, which amazing. And this included McDonald's. Campbell's tomato soup, and even Jif peanut butter. And after she started with these commercials, her career started to take off. So she also did TV show appearances and even was in some movies and did voice work. One role in the miniseries Fatal Vision that came out in 1984 had her in it, and she played a little girl who was murdered by her father. An unsettling kind of foreshadowing for what we're going to talk about today, which makes it a little bit even more grim. Yes, yes. So as Lindsay said, Judith was pretty small. And so this led her to sometimes playing characters that were younger than she was. And when we look at pictures of her, too, she does look much younger. But like Lindsay said, all of the people in Hollywood were like, yes, because she could take direction better because she was older, but playing the little smaller roles. As a person who doesn't have children, but is child adjacent now, I mean, I would say 
I understand children ages a little bit more than I once did, but I'm still like, I have no clue how old this child is in a television show. Or even when it's like, I'm watching something where someone's supposed to be a teenager and I'm like, I don't know if they're 15 or 27. I could not tell you. I feel like when they're really small, it's a little easier to tell. But yeah, like now teenagers, I'm like, oh, that person's like 35. And they're like, actually, we're 19. I'm like, oh, I did not look like that at that age. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, sometimes some kids will take offense to this, but she was playing younger characters, but she seemed to be just loving doing this. From everything we saw, she seemed very happy, right? Her agent, Ruth Hansen, described her as being a happy, bubbly little girl. Those that knew Judith said that she was always very polite and she was very, very talented. So, of course, she was successful. Her career was growing. Everything seemed to be going well for her. She was making around 100000 a year around 1985 or 1986. Sources varied for that. This helped her parents purchase a three-bedroom home in the Canoga Park neighborhood. Right after moving in, Joseph put up a spiked fence around the property. And from what we saw, this was not the norm for that neighborhood. Even today, when we look at pictures on Zillow, so like of the neighboring houses and everything, no one has a fence, let alone like a big spiked fence. Yeah, well, also when you have a little kid, that's a weird thing to have. Well, it's weird because like he's trying to either, you know, keep people out, but also kind of keep people in at the same time. Exactly. Unfortunately, even though she played it very well that she was happy, her little life wasn't really all that happy. Her father was very abusive and he was a pretty heavy drinker and had anger problems. So much so that his drinking got him arrested on three separate occasions for drunk driving. So we're going to talk a little bit more about Joseph and his history so you can understand who he was. No excuses because he's a piece of shit. But here we are. So his daughter from a previous marriage, Augie, gave some insight into his past. She said that when he was born in Hungary, he didn't have a father. And she said, quote, in Hungary, if you don't have a father, it's just like the plague. So when he went to school, kids would make fun of him. So he had basically no self-esteem. And the only time he felt like a person was when he was intoxicated. Now, the marriage between Joseph and Augie's mother didn't work out and it ended in a bitter divorce. Augie's mother was Clara and that was Joseph's first wife. He and Clara met while they were both immigrating to France and they got married quickly. They had two children, Barna and Augie. And they moved to New York in the early 1960s. And that's when Joseph began to drink and abuse his family. In 1968, Claire and the kids left him and went to live in Arizona. Joseph followed them because he wanted to try to get his family back together. And things went pretty okay for about a year. And then he started back up. He threw a fucking cast iron skillet at Clara. That's scary. Which like, what the fuck? That's terrifying. That's a heavy thing to throw, a heavy thing to be have it thrown at you. That's very scary. Yeah. So Clara filed for divorce and left him for good then. And at this point, Augie vowed to never speak to Joseph ever again. And unfortunately, from everything we've seen, it's very clear that the way that Augie was growing up when Joseph was in the picture is very similar to the life that Judith had lived. Yeah. Yeah. So... We're going to talk a little bit about the specifics of what he did. And as I said, he had some anger problems, and he usually took that anger out on Maria and Judith. So many of these reported incidents that we're going to talk about are from friends and neighbors. And unfortunately, when they were recorded, they don't really have exact dates. So we just try to include as many as we could in the order that we think that they may have happened in. As Judith became more successful, his abuse got worse. And a lot of people speculate that he was very jealous of her career or even embarrassed that he couldn't pull his own weight. I would imagine that if he had low self-esteem, which he clearly did, this would really inflame that even more. Earlier, you had mentioned that they were able to buy a house once her career really started taking off. And that was partially because they moved to a better neighborhood. But if you are a man who feels very small already needing your daughter's income, To be able to do that would probably not do wonders for your self-esteem. Yeah. If your kid is making money, that is your kid's money, not yours. That should be put aside for your child. It's one thing if you're like, oh, we're going here and there for auditions and we need to pay for that. But living off of your child's income is a different thing altogether. Mm -hmm. 
So one time, Judith was given a brand new kite by her mom, and her dad snatched it away. And she was worried he was going to break it, right? So she kind of cried out like, oh, don't break it. And he responded by calling her a spoiled brat who didn't know how to share. Ew. And then he smashed the kite. And I want to say this one was seen by a neighbor at the time. Even if she was acting spoiled, why break it? That's simply violence for the sake of it. Right. And don't snatch it. Like, say, oh, can I see it? You know, like, Mm -hmm. be polite. Don't just, yeah. He's an awful human. Yeah. You teach children to act like little adults so that they learn how to be adults. Yeah. Right. So he also threatened to kill Maria a number of times. And he even said that he wanted to kill Judith to make Maria suffer. Very sad. So he's clearly just a bad fucking human. Yes, yes. So one evening, he followed Judith into the kitchen and he yanked her ponytail. And this caused her to hit the floor. And from what I understand, this was during a house party. And he didn't like the attention that he was receiving from guests, you know, because that's fucking awful. And so as an apology, he went out shopping the following day and bought Judith a pink TV for her room. And so I think that that's what he'd do, is he'd do something horrible, he'd try to get their forgiveness. Do something horrible, try to get forgiveness over and over and over again. Yeah, that's part of the cycle of abuse, right? Yes. Yeah. Most of the time, people who are awful aren't awful all of the time. That's why the other person sometimes stays, is because it's not always bad. Right. So then on Judith's eighth birthday party in 1986, she had it at a bowling alley with her friends, and they were from school, so a bunch of people. Joseph was not present for this party. And when another parent asked where her dad was, Maria replied, quote, stuck at home getting drunk. Fuck. So many people knew uh, about his alcoholism. Often, Maria and Judith would try to stay out of the house as long as possible. So like during the days, they would take little trips. So they'd run errands, go to restaurants, shop, like do whatever they could so that they weren't in the home as long as possible. But from what I understand, at least it was like bonding, mother-daughter bonding time. Yeah, yeah. So in December of 1986, Maria filed a police report against Joseph. When police came, they saw no visible injuries, and she ended up declining to prosecute. And if you're thinking today, you absolutely do not need visible injuries in order to prosecute. But it would be easier It would be a lot harder to convict someone today. So if you're thinking of 1986, almost 40 years ago, a woman who was trying to press charges, I just don't think they would be successful. So some think that this may have been a little bit of a wake up call for Joseph because he stopped drinking at this point. But the abuse continued. So he then does this kind of very bizarre act to keep his wife from leaving him and to control her more, where he hides a telegram that came from Hungary that was addressed to Maria. What the telegram had in it was it was letting her know that a relative passed, but he was afraid she would go to Hungary. So he threw it away so she couldn't see it. Not surprisingly, somebody from Maria's family then reached out to her and called her. And that's when she learned about the telegram. She confronted Joseph about it. And he denied knowing about it. But then a few hours later, pulled it out of the trash and was like, I did have it. Which like, just being shitty for the fucking sake of it. Yeah. And so on top of losing a relative, you have this fuck. Amanda mentioned it earlier that like other people were aware of the threats that Maria was getting from Joseph. And that included several other adults. That included Peter Kilvin, who was a friend of Joseph. Joseph had told him many times that he had wanted to kill his wife. What Peter had said was he was like, I would try to calm him down. And at one point he said, if you kill her, what will happen to your little one? And Joseph responded, I got to kill her too. That give you chills. But so another neighbor claimed that Joseph mentioned that he would kill himself and Judith and then leave Maria alive to suffer. And there are more adults too, but we'll, t- we'll get to them in a moment. But like, you really have to hate someone to want to inflict that type of pain on them. Mm-hmm. And that's also just like a strange thing to be out there fucking telling people. Could you imagine if someone was doing that today? In hindsight, it's really easy to be like, he said this, you should have known. But when someone makes this kind of threat over and over and over and over again, it doesn't seem like an explosive exclamation. It seems like a thing this person says. And if you don't know what's going on behind the scenes, then you don't see that this is part of a pattern of abuse and that it's part of a much larger and deeper issue. Agreed. So I don't think it's 
like the neighbor's fault by any means. I don't think it's anybody's fault other than Joseph, but it is just so unfortunate because there were so many people who had a window in and saw like one issue. Yeah, some knowledge, a piece of knowledge. You know, or one piece. And they they don't know, but like it just sucks. Yes. Yes. This whole thing's just horrible. So the abuse continued and Judith, who was always known to be such a happy little girl, started showing signs of stress. She started telling her friends that she was scared to go home. This breaks my heart. She told them, quote, my daddy is drunk every day and I know he wants to kill my mother. At one time, she even told them that her father threw pots and pans at her and it caused a nosebleed. Baby. So it's just like escalating. Heartbreaking. When Judith was preparing to fly to the Bahamas to film the Jaws movie, which should have been so exciting, right? Like this is a big movie. You get to go to stay at the Bahamas? Like paradise, right? It should be really exciting. Well, her dad came in and he threatened her and he brought a knife and put it up to her and said, quote, if you and your mother don't come back after the shooting, I'm going to cut your throat, which terrified her, obviously, right? So she's supposed to be acting in this big movie. She's just terrified. When this threat occurred, she was only eight years old. And I can't imagine that she could have acted like an eight-year-old who was being threatened. It would be so reasonable for an eight-year-old to be like scared and crying at that type of violence and that type of threat. And I doubt that she would have been able to have done that. Mm -hmm. She just must have been so scared. Yeah. So Maria went with her to the Bahamas. And while there, Maria started telling everyone, anyone who would listen about the abuse. Judith's studio teacher, so the one that kind of stepped in when she couldn't attend school, her name was Linda. And later she said in an interview that Maria was constantly crying out about how concerned she was and how threatened she felt. And this kind of broke my heart, too, is she said almost to the point where nobody took her seriously. They were just like, oh, Maria's at it again. But they didn't do anything, even though she felt this way and she was sharing it. I really do think that one of the scariest things about domestic violence is that it is this double edged sword where if you say too much People have this expectation of what you should be doing. And if that was happening, you would be doing this, right? They act as though like one plus one equals two. Mm -hmm. And they know what they do in that situation. Yeah. As a person who has been in multiple abusive relationships, I had this picture of what I would do and who I would be in those situations. And that was not who I was. It's different when it's you. Like, that's all I can say is that it's, it's so different when it's you Mm -hmm. because typically by the time it gets really bad it's been bad for a while and you you didn't realize it and it happened little by little by little and you're torn down and you're just like not this version of yourself that you thought you were so like maybe maria had the strength to be like telling people and what she needed was like someone to say like you don't deserve this Let me help you out of it. But a lot of times people are like, oh, you have to just do it yourself. And I would say, especially during this time period, this is like very much a what happens behind closed doors time period still. Yeah. And like what happens in a marriage is what happens in a marriage. And it's heartbreaking that like no one really took her seriously. Yeah. So when the filming finished, Maria and Judith, instead of going straight home, they actually went to Maria's brother's house in New York. But Joseph tracked them down. Joseph Weldon, Maria's brother, I'm just going to refer to him as Weldon so we don't get the Josephs confused. He overheard a conversation between Joseph and Judith over the phone. And he said that Joseph said, quote, remember what I told you before you left. After hearing this, Judith dropped the phone and started crying. Gives me chills like this poor little girl, how scared and like horrible her life was here. So Maria picked up the phone and berated her husband from what Weldon said. But in another interview, Weldon did say that she looked pretty scared. And Maria and Judith ended up returning the next day. So they get back to California from New York. And Judith, unsurprisingly, starts to show signs of stress physically. She starts plucking out her eyelashes. Again, she is eight. Severe stress. She's also plucking out her cat's whiskers, which please don't take that as like animal abuse. Take that as mental illness. Yeah, she loved her cat. Yeah, like she's going through it. She also starts gaining weight. Around this time, there's also pressure for Judith to start to grow taller so she can start to prep for older roles. 
because again, she's getting older, which means like her baby voice is only going to stay for so long. She's going to start to look like a young woman. So because she was so tiny, she started receiving hormone injections to help with her growth. From what we could see, it seems like she may have had an issue with her pituitary gland. And so her puberty was delayed. Then Maria starts taking her to UCLA to start receiving these injections. Instead of doing those normal outings that we talked about earlier, that's what they're doing. So like when they're staying away from home, it's not just joy anymore. It's now going and getting these injections so that she can start to appear older and go through puberty. So Judith was a big fan of the show Growing Pains. So she was super excited when she got to play the young version of Carol Seaver from the show. And while she was working on set, Judith got close to Tracy Gold, who began to see Judith as her little sister. It was a cute relationship. Yeah. Gold offered to help Maria when she learned of the abuse, but Maria declined. Now, before an audition in May of 1988, when Judith was almost 10, she was extremely upset. And we also saw that this breakdown may have been because she was asked to sing Soon You'll Come Home for the movie All Dogs Go to Heaven. But she was never able to do that. And they had to have somebody else sing the song. She was so upset that she couldn't talk for a little bit. Finally, she told her agent everything that was going on at home. And so Amanda mentioned her earlier, but her agent was Ruth Hansen. And she insisted that Judith see a child psychiatrist, which I really do find fascinating that they took her to see one, given that what was happening in the home. If you're her parents, you know what the fuck is going on. So you know what she's going to go then tell that psychiatrist. Right, right. And yeah, I believe it was just Maria that took her, obviously. I'm surprised Maria took her. Also, mental health in the 80s. Not great. Right. But so Judith went to see a mental health professional and they identified severe physical and emotional abuse. Ruth tried to get details, but all that she was told was, quote, it's extreme verbal, mental, and emotional problems with this child, and I have to report it to Children's Services. That professional reported the case to the Los Angeles County Department of Children and Family Services. So at this point, we're like, okay, finally, like, professionals are going to help. But unfortunately, as they began to investigate, Maria shared with them that she planned on divorcing her husband and that she was going to move out of the home and pretty much that she had a plan. I wish she would have done this, you know, like on paper, it makes sense, but. Like Lindsay brought up, it's not always that easy. She wasn't able to actually do all of that. But because she told them she had a plan, they fucking dropped the case. And we'll talk about details later as to why they closed the case and how overwhelmed they were at the time. But still, you know, those words, yeah, severe. And they're just like, well, you have a plan. Good luck. Thank you. So that's what we've heard in various places is that, yeah, Maria shared that she had a plan. All was going to be good. They dropped it. However, Ruth did report that the interaction between Maria and Children's Services went a bit different. She was told by Maria that Children's Services was not going to do anything to help her or Judah, and that if something was going to happen, she was going to have to initiate it herself. So I don't know if that was just Maria saying like, oh, they're putting it all on me, or if that happened, because later on we'll find that it seems like they, they did just close it because she had a plan. I mean, also, Child Protective Services isn't there for Maria. Exactly. Maria wanting to leave her husband, that is something she would have to initiate because that's not what Child Protective Services does. Right, right. So as we've said it before, Maria was scared to leave her home and husband for a number of reasons. Some suspect that she was afraid to leave because then her and Judith would have to go into hiding. And so that would mean that they may have to give up Judith's career. And that was a source of income as Maria didn't work. Yeah. But another big reason, honestly, was so many threats. And he threatened to hurt them or even kill them numerous times. Maria had told a neighbor, her name was Eunice Daly, quote, I can't because he'll come after us and he'll kill us. And he's threatened to burn the house down. She said this to Eunice the Friday before she was killed. (sighs) She also shared with her that she was considering filing for divorce and moving into an apartment. And we're going to talk about that in a minute, too. Additionally, when the two were chatting, they talked about how Maria had planned to cash a check. And that was Judith's $12,000 federal tax refund. And she planned on cashing it that day before Joseph could get a hold of it. So, like, she had a big chunk of money ready to go, or at least she was trying to get it ready. 
And from what I understand, too, one neighbor even offered for Maria and Judith to come stay with them, but Maria declined. And I think that that might have been too close, too. Like, it probably wouldn't have been safe enough. So even though Maria was very scared, it seems like she did start to take some early steps into leaving. She may have started researching divorce. And Maria's niece, Eve, also brought up that she had spoken to her aunt around Christmas time in 1987 and that Maria had mentioned that things were starting to improve. And that's because Joseph had found another woman. From what Eve was told from Maria, the woman was well off and Maria was looking into seeing a lawyer about the divorce. And another thing that Eve mentioned is that her aunt said, this is the best thing that had happened to her, like that he had someone else. And so it was like a reason to get the divorce. So Maria also rented an apartment in Panorama City, and it was closer to the movie studio, so it was just easier. From what we could find, she did this around May of 1988. Judith and Maria would stay here during filming during the day, but it sounds like they would return home at night. So it was just kind of like a place to be in between filming. This also, having this apartment, seemed like it might have been another reason that the case with family services was dropped, because it sounded like she had a safe place to go and was actively working on getting out. Which again, fucking horrible. One source even said that she notified CPS that she was divorcing him and moving into the apartment, and that the case may have been closed that same day. Now, Judas' manager, Ruth, kept urging Maria to leave, like she knew now what was going on. But Maria shared that she was worried about losing everything that she loved, including their home, like they had worked so hard to get their home. It seems like, though, depending on who she was talking to, she was giving them kind of a different story. So some she was like, yep, I'm ready to leave. This is what I'm going to do. And then others she was she would say, like, I'm just so scared. I, I think that something bad will happen if I leave. In June of 1988, Joseph reached out to his son, Barna, who later told Augie that their father wanted to see them and to make amends. Joseph had told them that he was married and that the two of them had half-siblings. Augie was hesitant at first, but she was curious about her sister and wanted to meet her. Barna and Augie ended up accepting the invitation and visited just in time for Judith's 10th birthday. Barna spent the entire time with Joseph and Maria, but Augie spent her time with Judith. And Judith was thrilled to have a big sister. Augie noticed something wasn't right, and she could see herself in Judith. Augie pulled Maria aside and demanded to know what was happening. And Maria admitted what was going on, the abuse, but also said that he wasn't drinking anymore. Augie then told Maria to get out and take Judy and to be safe. But Maria didn't want to give up the house that they had worked so hard to get. And if anyone was going to leave, it was going to be Joseph. So she then describes that she was trying to basically drive Joseph away and that he was a person who was obsessed with cleanliness. So Maria allowed the house to become a complete mess. And it was so messy that when Augie visited, she had offered to help clean. But Maria was like, no, it's going to drive him crazy and it'll drive him out of the house if we don't clean up. But that didn't work. And this next part is just it's just so heartbreaking. And whenever we talk about it, we we just like start to tear up because As Barna and Augie were getting ready to leave to go home to Arizona, Judith ran up to them as they headed out the door. And Barna continued to load things into the car, and Augie talked to Judith. And she said, Augie, take me with you. I'm scared that father is going to do something bad. Augie tried to assure Judith that things were going to be okay. She even explained, you know, that he had hurt Augie and Barna when they were kids, and everything was okay, and that this was temporary. Augie told Judith she had to be strong. In a later interview, Augie said that she would never forget the look in Judith's eyes as she left. Which, I mean, again, it gets us every time. It's just so sad. And my heart goes out to Augie because there's no way she could have known for certain what was going to happen. And I don't think that there's anything else that she could have done. No, not at all. And just learning that that happened, you know, like the how much fell onto Augie with that too and she had to live with that yeah yeah and that interaction like what could she have done it's not like she could have been like get in the car let's go makes me tear up every time even just reading it like when we made our notes reading it again hurts my heart one of the other things that I think is worth mentioning 
is that it is not too far back in our history that divorce was a bit more difficult. There were periods of time where you couldn't just divorce someone because things weren't working out. You would have to go through a a statutorily defined separation period. Sometimes there would need to be evidence of abuse. Other times there would need to be evidence of infidelity. And even then it was still difficult. And another thing that just kind of comes to mind is that if Joseph is very controlling, it's completely possible that he was holding Maria's passport from her. So that would definitely keep her from leaving. I want to say, too, that I read somewhere that he sometimes would hide passports. So it would totally make sense there. Yeah. And so in July of 1988, shortly before the murders, Joseph followed Maria to that apartment in Panorama City. She was carrying boxes and he confronted her. She said, oh, I'm just helping a friend move in. But of course, he didn't buy that. Around the same time is when she told the neighbor that she was cashing that check as well. So many suspect that, you know, she was working on getting out and perhaps he figured it out. And that might be why he actually acted on his threats. And the fact that he followed her there, you know, like, so he he suspected something was up Mm -hmm. and he pretty much just proved it to himself that, yeah, she had another place. So now we're going to talk about what happened on July 27th of 1988, around 830 in the morning, Eunice, the neighbor, she was watering her garden and she heard an explosion next door. In an interview later on, she said, quote, my first thought as I ran to call 911 was he's done it. He's killed them and set a fire in the house, just like he said he would. I hate it. I hate it. And it makes me just teary eyed. That's so sad. Unfortunately, she was correct. She had dropped her hose to go call 911, and another neighbor, his name was Michael Cutt, grabbed the hose and ran to the Barcy house because it was on fire. He opened the back door, but unfortunately, he was unable to do much due to the amount of smoke and the flames. When investigators got there and the fire was put out, they found that Judith and Maria had likely been killed a couple days before. They estimate that they were killed on or around July 25th. And the reason for this is Judith had been seen riding her bike that morning on the 25th. I've seen varying reports, either it was morning or like afternoon or early afternoon. And she was riding her bike in the street. So a few of the neighbors saw her. And that's the last time that they did. Also, Judith did have an audition that same day and she never showed up for it. It was for an upcoming animated series. So probably more voiceover work. Some speculate that maybe Maria and Joseph got into an argument that day. And either Judith didn't want to go because she wasn't, you know, mentally doing well, or another horrible one, that he was holding them hostage at that time. Her manager, Ruth, called to see why she missed her appointment, and she called around noon on July 26th, so the following day. Joseph answered, which surprised her because he never really answered the phone. And he said, quote, they went to San Diego. A black car took them away. I'm just here to get my things and say goodbye to my little girl. Ruth was very confused. So she's like, okay, hung up. And then she tried to call again a few hours later, but no one answered. Now, where Judith was found, she was in her bed facing the window and she had been shot in the head. There are many people online that suspect that she was sleeping when she was shot. And I I truly hope that she didn't know it was coming. But there's a lot that say that they have reason to believe she might have been awake. So sad. Maria was in the hallway and it's believed that she heard the shot and she went running. So as Maria was running, She was met with Joseph in the hallway, and there may have been a struggle, and then she was killed. She was also shot. Both Judith and Maria were doused in gasoline. Joseph ignited the fire before taking his own life while he was in the garage. All of the bodies were burned. Joseph was found with a gun still in his hand and the gas can about four feet away from his body. He had lived with their bodies for days before taking his own life. I simply cannot understand how one could do this generally, but especially to a child that they raised. My brain just can't get there, which I guess is a good thing that I can't think that way, especially a little girl. So on August 9th, Maria and Judith were buried side by side. Tracy Gold from Growing Pains read the eulogy at the funeral. Later in August, Judge Catherine Doitad of the Juvenile Dependency Court declared that she found good cause for a watchdog company to review how children's services handled the case, which, I mean, they didn't, right? Like, so in an interview, Helen Kleinberg, 
a member of the Watchdog Commission for Children's Services, said, It is frightening because it appears that people on the outside took the right steps and we didn't manage it. She also said that she wasn't happy about the department's account of the case when they were questioned about it and that she was upset by the reports that the case had been closed at the mother's request. Robert Caffey, the Department of Children's Services director, defended how the agency handled it, which like, ugh. And so he said, the child's mother wanted it closed and said, in essence, thank you very much. I don't need you anymore. Kleinberg's retort to this is, from my point of view, the child was the client, not the mother, which fucking absolutely, it's child services. It's the child. Mm -hmm. And so Kleinberg also went on to say, one of the reasons the county did not act was that Judith was suffering from emotional, not physical abuse. She also mentioned that before a case can be closed, caseworkers should visit the home or interview the child. And in this case, it doesn't sound like anyone ever talked to Judith. I don't get it. No. When asked about this, Director Caffey said that he could not recall, which we're assuming that he says no because he's not going to just come out and say no. Right. He also tries to give like a reason why this could have slipped through the cracks. He says that the department's 1,150 workers handle on average 50 to 55 cases when the norm should be 40 to 45. And then at that point, they were down by 160 case workers due to both retirements and the county hiring freeze. It's rumored that Judith's particular caseworker had 67 cases at the time. And while, like, theoretically, I can sympathize with a person who has an intensely heavy caseload, when your caseload is the lives of children, I just don't think any get to slip through the cracks. It seems as though there were pretty immediate plans after this to revamp how employees were trained, how new policies were implemented, and how people like therapists or others that have to report how they get notified if the case is closed. Because in Judith's case, her therapist wasn't notified. And if you're thinking of this duty to report, it's you have a duty to report when you immediately hear it. But if you find out the case is closed and that the abuse is ongoing, you then have a new duty, which is to report it again, because the case should be open until the child is no longer in danger. And just another note, on set where she was filming or having her voice recorded, the Department of Labor had workers there who were there to make sure child workers were okay. And they saw that Judith was distressed, but they never reported this to anyone. And we've seen this information in articles that cite the, a family friend having said this. So we don't know whether it's 100% true or not. Oftentimes, we will talk about like positive changes that come from some of the, the worst cases. And this feels like an instance where there shouldn't have to be big changes that happen because of what happened to Judith. Maybe they should have just gotten this right on the first time. Maybe you should train your employees and have policies that protect children if the entire purpose is to protect children. Like, that just seems like a no-brainer. Agreed. Yeah. Well said. The other part that I think of, too, is for how many cases each caseworker had, how many more were slipping through the cracks at that time? Makes my heart so sad. So another thing that was published in September of 1988 by the LA Times was an article written by Sherry Barber. And she went through her experiences with Maria and Judith. And I just thought it was important to include because she had kind of some inside knowledge because she knew both of them. Now, Sherry Barber is Andrea Barber's mom. And Andrea Barber played Kimmy Gibbler in Full House. So everyone knows who she is. She was a good actress. She still is. She's in the reboot, I think, too. I haven't seen her in other things, but she played a good character. She did. She did. Yeah. And so some of these stories, I just, they were touching. So Sherry and Maria would run into each other often at additions, you know, because they were the moms, right? She recalled a time that she had asked Maria, hey, do you have any vacation plans? Maria's response was that she wanted to take Judith to Hungary to meet her family because she had never met them but she was afraid her husband would burn the house down. At first, Sherry wasn't sure what she meant. She was like, is she just letting off steam? What's going on? But then she's like, I believed her. She described Maria as being straightforward and not a woman to exaggerate or over-dramatize anything that she said. So she's like, I feel like she was telling the truth. 
She also recalled that Maria would talk to Judith in Hungarian, and then she would speak English to others. Maria was someone that would tell people exactly what she thought without embarrassment or apology. And so because of all of this, she never imagined that Maria would be a victim. Maria also mentioned that her husband showed her where he kept the gasoline can and how he intended to use it. At that point, Sherry put her arm around Maria's shoulders and said goodbye, but she couldn't get the conversation out of her head. She even told her husband how she even noticed that Judith didn't have any eyelashes and that she started gaining weight. Later, after their deaths, she found out through news coverage that those were signs of stress. And so that like stuck with her. After their deaths, she ended up reaching out to a local crisis helpline because she kept replaying all the conversations with Maria over and over and over again in her head, and she was having a hard time sleeping. Their response was that there's nothing that she could have done not to feel responsible and just feel the sadness. But she says, no, it wasn't just sadness. It was torment. Also, the operator said, quote, there's nothing you could have done that she didn't already know. It follows a pattern. These women have no self-esteem and they go back over and over again. The only person that could have helped Maria was Maria herself. She alone knew her situation and how to alter it. Not all abusive men kill. While I hear that and it sounds harsh, it doesn't sound like a thing you want to hear when you're grieving, but it is also not incorrect. And when you think about, obviously, people who are facing domestic violence, does everyone have zero self-esteem? Likely not zero, but it's probably low, right? Like it's they've been torn down. And if a person does not want to get out of a situation or is not ready, They might go back. So there's only so much you can do for someone other than continuing to be there, continuing to be a resource, continuing to care, to continuing to have a hard conversation and supporting them because it is a hard thing to watch someone you love stay in an abusive relationship. If you turn your back, then they don't have you. So I get what they're trying to tell her is that like she couldn't love Maria out of that. She couldn't take Maria out of it. She couldn't save her and Judith. That was something Maria had to be able to do for them. It it does sound harsh. It sounds harsh. And then just thinking how the system failed them too at the same time. Exactly. Yeah. It's hard. Yeah. I mean, like, that's why I'm like, it's not, is it the most gentle way of saying that? No. But is it also partially true that Maria had to be the one? And as much as Sherry wanted to help her, she couldn't do it for her. She could only support her through it. And I think that's just like the hardest thing to wrap your head around when you have somebody who you love who's going through that is that like you can't do it for them. You have to be able to just be there with them. So in Sherry's article, she also described a time where her daughter, she was around seven or eight, got cast in a movie of the week called Do You Remember Love with Judith? And the two girls played sisters. And They got to share a trailer and they started to get really close. So the way that the trailer was set up, it was split in two. It was kind of like an accordion style (laughs) folding door so the girls could have privacy to rest and such. But they often would play and hang out even though the door was closed and they would take turns reading from storybooks. Judith would call out to Andrea and tell her knock knock jokes, which is especially cute when there's a door in between. Yeah, I love it. Right. I can just picture the scene. Right. Like, Can you just picture it? Mm hmm. And the two would pass notes under the door. Sherry remembers a very sweet little note from Judith to Andrea that said, I like you, Andrea. And she had drawn a bird with some flowers and a few hearts. So cute. Andrea responded with a note back to her. And then since the girls were passing notes, Sherry decided to pass one to Maria that said she respected and admired her. And she thought she was a good mother. And Maria later thanked her. Which just general note. Everyone wants a kind note from a friend. You cannot get too many of those. You cannot say enough nice things to the people you love. Always do it. I just liked her little stories. I thought they were sweet. Yes. Yes. I like it too. And I'm glad that she shared them with the world too. Like to see that there was little good spots too. So one time while filming, Joseph came to deliver an item to his wife that she had forgotten. Sherry described him as big and burly. He insisted that his daughter greet him which is very bizarre. Yeah. Then he talked to Maria for a little bit. And when he was out of earshot, Maria said to Sherry, when he was young, he looked like Mario Lanza. 
I'm assuming that's a handsome person. I looked it up. Yeah, it's just an old actor, I believe. And then for three years, Maria didn't mention him again. Sherry talked about the funeral and how her and Andrea attended. Sherry also learned that Maria had tried to get help from various different agencies, but she never could find out why they failed to pursue the issues further, which is so sad. Yeah. So now with more awareness to what happened, Sherry spent a lot of time talking with local and national helplines to learn about the situation of abuse. And I just thought this was important that she shared it with everyone. She said now that she feels more confident about recognizing distress signals and interpreting the vocabulary of a woman in trouble, quote, she needs to know the problem is not her fault. I'll assure her that she knows her situation better than anyone else and that I trust her decisions. I'll offer my support in helping her act on those decisions. And the end of the article was heartbreaking, but I think very powerful. She said, quote, Though it would be arrogant to think that I might have saved someone's life, it's not arrogant to plan for the future. Thanks to the helplines, I now have something specific to say and something specific to offer. Instead of tormenting myself with what I didn't do, I concentrate on what I can do. If there's a next time, I might make a difference. I think that that's a really beautiful way of honoring her friends and to grow something from her grief. Yeah. Because it is an incredibly hard thing to lose someone. And it's even harder to be able to take that and turn it into a way to love people moving forward. I just, I thought it was so nice that she shared it, you know, shared that with everyone. She didn't have to, but gave us glimmers of Judith's life, her friendship with Maria, and then, you know, what steps she did to help heal herself and then to be ready to help someone else again later. Yeah. So I really am excited to talk about Judith's legacy because she was so wonderful, right? She was only 10 years old when she died. And after her death, the two animated movies, The Land Before Time, came out in 1988. And then her final film was All Dogs Go to Heaven in 1989. And like I said at the beginning, I watched those movies all the time as a kid. I can recite most of the words and the the songs and everything from them. And for those that loved Land Before Time, she played Ducky. And it is rumored that that was her favorite role ever. It's such a fun role. It's so cute. Now, you probably remember her famous line of, yep, 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 right? Like, when I think of Ducky, that's exactly what I think of. Yeah. Something very sweet that we saw is when Don Bluth, who was the director, asked her to play the role of Ducky, Judith's reply was, yep, yep, yep. And so he took that phrase and incorporated it into her character. I love that. So like, that's actually a piece of Judith. Yes, I love that so much. It is also on her tombstone at Forest Lawn Memorial Park in Los Angeles. So her tombstone has yep, yep, yep. And so does her mother's, who's next to her. And something that I actually found really sad, though, was that they were in unmarked graves for years until 2004, when fans actually purchased the headstones for both Judith and Maria. Which is so sad, but like, it it does make sense that without someone there to advocate for them, who would? Yeah, yeah. But you can see the pictures of the, the memorials. They're, they're very cute. Now, in All Dogs Go to Heaven, she played Anne Marie. And the ending song, Love Survives, is dedicated to Judith's memory. That gets me. I know. Additionally, Don Bluth, again, the director, was so heartbroken over Judith's death that he based Anne Marie's design and mannerisms on her. Oh, man, that gets me. Yeah. This was to honor her memory and help him cope with the loss. He said she was, quote, absolutely astonishing. She understood verbal direction, even in the most sophisticated of situations, and that he had hoped that he would be able to use her talents in many more movies that he would direct in the future. Yeah. I mean, I can't, when you think about, like, as an adult, and you get to know little kids in your life, especially something like this, where you're working with them a lot over a short period of time. Like, I would imagine that there were people who loved her and cared about her and were like, expecting to see her grow up. And like, that just I can't. Mm. We knew we'd cry. We knew we'd cry. Right. I see that movie so different now. Yeah. So let's move to our next section, where we'll just be so angry. In 2020, there was a show filmed at the Barcy home called Murder House Flip. I hadn't heard of this 
before ever. I was so blissfully unaware of this new thing to be annoyed by. What the show did was it brought designers, paranormal experts, and other professionals to homes where there had been murders to reimagine the homes to help families be comfortable living in these houses. And so, like, okay, I don't disagree that it makes sense to be able to, like, use a a property after something terrible has happened. That is a good thing. However, I don't know why we would need to make a show about it. Like, feel free to just go ahead and do that, especially because when when we're talking about things like this, when it's very recent, it feels like incredibly in poor taste. It's one thing when the when the murder has been like 100 years ago. It's different when like the victim's families are alive. Yeah. And even if it's 100 years ago, it should still be respectful and not just be sensationalized. Agreed. Agreed. At first, I was like, I'm not sure how I feel. I honestly thought it was a joke. Like, I when I was reading, there was an article from People about it. And I was like, this can't, this isn't a thing, is it? Also, as we were researching, April Fool's Day had happened, too. So I was like, this isn't a real thing. But it was. And we've discussed it before in Haunted House episodes. But depending on the state and how long ago the murders actually occurred, you don't always need to be disclosed that that happened when you're buying a home. So, like, I get how horrible some people would feel, right? Or, you know, they'd feel stuck in a home that maybe they don't love anymore because this happened and they didn't know. So, like, I get wanting to help them out. Absolutely. That is a horrible situation I never want to be in. Yeah. But I feel like there is a way to do it tastefully, like you said. And we'll talk about it in a minute. But there's so many things that were not so great about this show that we were able to see. And in one clip that I found, they were focusing more on, like, the blood that they found beneath some tile than they were about the victim that it was from. And that's where I was like- Oh, I do not like like that. I don't like that, yeah. And that made me really upset because- That's gross. The way that the show was done was just not the correct way. If they were going to be like talking about the victims and saying, here's their life, here's what happened, it's horrible. We want to make sure that the worst thing that happened to them isn't still around. You know, like that the blood from their murder is not there anymore. Or- that it's properly cleaned up because as we've talked about, it's not always cleaned up right. Sure. But just the way that they're like, let's remodel. This is like HGTV. Didn't like that. Made me feel gross. As it should, because that's disgusting. Yeah. Yeah. Like just abso-fucking-lutely disgusting. Yeah. Like Amanda said, it's hard to find clips of this. It's also particularly hard to find this episode. We couldn't find it. It looked like it was on Quibi and then it was also on the Roku channel, but... We couldn't see where it was actually available. We were able to find articles that had clips, but from what we could tell, shocker here, it wasn't done well and it wasn't respectful in the way that it should be. And again, they're not giving attention to actual victims in the homes outside of just their murders. And like, we really do our best to like talk about a person, not just the worst thing that happened to them, because otherwise it feels so exploitative. Mm -hmm. And that's not how they want to be remembered. No, no. Additionally, the show seemed like they were attempting to be like an HGTV home renovation show. But because they were short, it like missed the mark there, too. So it was like bad for true crime, but also bad for like a home renovation show. Like it was like bad in every way it could be. Yeah. Again, I can't find it because they Quibi doesn't exist anymore. But the way that I understood is like each episode was like eight to 10 minutes and they'd break it into like three. So there'd be like eight to 10 minutes, eight to 10 minutes, eight to 10 minutes. And that would be one home. So under 30 minutes to describe everything plus renovate a house. What? It's too much. Yeah, it's way too much. Reviews that we've seen say that like it looks like it was a cash grab, which it sounds like it was. Mm hmm. One of the executive producers is also rumored to have said this when finding homes for season two. It's actually sad to say it isn't hard to find homes where the murders took place. The challenge was finding homes where notable crimes took place that were interesting at some level, as tragic as they were, and willing homeowners who were looking, and in some cases, desperate for some sort of reboot to their house. Ugh, get fucked. Right? Like, oh, yours isn't interesting enough. Your murder wasn't interesting enough. That was just like, what the fuck? And this same executive producer said when they were talking about the process of finding homeowners, 
We did door knocks. We did Facebook searching. We had some recommendations from police departments. We tried everything. Ew. Right? And we were trying to find the articles that these came from. They're not there anymore. But some people had snippets of it. So we couldn't tell who said it, just that it was someone yeah. that worked on the show. I mean, I would imagine if I was a person who was associated with this, I would not want my name with it a lot. Like, I would not be like, let's have this exist on the internet forever because sometimes things are just a bad idea. Yeah. Yeah. So the show covered the Barcy home. And in the episode, again, we couldn't find the whole episode, but we were able to find some clips and some things that like reviewed the episode. But what happened is the Burnell family moved into the home in 2001, and they didn't know what happened there. Quickly after purchasing, they started to feel a dark presence in the home. They felt random cold spots throughout the house. The garage door seemed to open and close by itself. And they said just weird things kept happening. And I don't know which family member said this, but they said that the hallway felt the most haunted. And Francisco Burnell, the homeowner, said that he would feel like someone was behind him in the hallway when he would try to walk down it. Ruth Barnell would also hear footsteps in the home. Now, their daughter, Gabby, her room used to be Judith's room. And she said that she would feel like someone was watching her when she tried to sleep. And one source that we found said that she was also unable to sleep facing the window. And that was the same way that Judith had died. And again, I don't know if that was like a true thing that happened or if that was just to sensationalize all of this. Yeah. I'm not sure. I could see either way. Yeah. Yeah. But from what we could see, too, the bed might have been in the same spot as where Judith's was. Which for a small room, like there's only so much you can do, you know, like to put the bed where it will fit. But anyways, another thing that the show brought up is that Gabby had an imaginary friend named Joseph. Supposedly, he was the one that would open and close the garage. But from what we could see, too, another source said the imaginary friend started when she was about two to three. So I don't know if that was just like a coincidence. But the real shitty part, this just made me mad because obviously, dude, this dad's name was Joseph, right? During the show. There's a clip of one of the hosts, and they're kind of talking about her imaginary friend. And the family had, you know, later found out that that was the murderer's name. And the host said, quote, if your little friend Joseph climbs up from under the bed, I'm going to give him a hammer because he's going to have to help me put some things together. So they clearly either one were completely fucked in the head or knew so little about what happened in that house that they didn't know the murderer's name was Joseph. I don't know if he knew. I'm assuming the way that it, the article seemed like is they talk about the murder, then they talk about the people living in the house. So I'd assume mm -hmm. he would have known at that point. But they may have filmed them separately, too. Maybe. But who could say? That's my sincere hope that that person wasn't like, I'm going to traumatize a child today. Ugh, yeah, I just didn't like that. So Gabby also mentioned having many nightmares. And so she covered her room in dream catchers, hoping that that would help her. And like, I can't imagine like, again, I don't know if this is sensationalized because they wanted to remodel the home. I'm not saying they're bad people or anything, but we don't know the way that the network spun it to them either. Exactly. Imagine, you know, buying a house and finding out what happened and then just having to live with that. That's tough. Yeah. One of the other things that we saw, too, is Gabby was 10 when they moved into that house, which was the same age as Judith. So, like I said, the family was unaware when they moved into the home until a neighbor actually mentioned what had happened. When the show remodeled the home, they focused on the hallway, Gabby's bedroom, and the backyard. Now, from what the article said, after the remodel, the family stopped feeling the negative energy. So, like, I really do hope that if there was something there, it's no longer there. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Just for that family's sake. But I did see two. I, I was just, you know, looking on Zillow just to see more about this home. The home was just sold again in 2022. So after the the show, because the the pictures of what they did for the remodel, like they took out Gabby's uh, window where Judith was, they took out that window and made it into French doors. And that's the pictures on Zillow now. So they sold hmm. it shortly after. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Woof. This was a rough case. This was a rough case. This was a hard one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had known about Judith's death for years, but I didn't know the extent of what happened until this week. Yeah, I vaguely had heard that she had died, but I didn't know any particulars. So because we covered some heavy, heavy topics today, we're going to give some resources. We're also going to put these in our show notes. If you suspect child abuse, there are various agencies in each state. 
and a national child abuse hotline open 24-7. The national line that services the U.S., Canada, the U.S. Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, and Guam is 1-800-4-A-CHILD or 1-800-422-4453. Also, the National Domestic Violence Hotline is 800-799-7233 if you need it or someone you love needs it. We hope that's not the case, but if it is the case, there are resources available. And also, you are a resource. So there's lots of things that you can look at on how to be an advocate for people in your life. And if you head to these websites too, um, so like National Domestic Violence Hotline or the Child Abuse Hotline, they have websites with some things to read. And I did see on some of them, they have like a live chat if you have questions as how to help someone else. Yeah. Yeah. And with that, have a good weekend. Thanks for creeping with us. Thanks for listening. And as always, a special thank you to our patrons who support us via Patreon. Please see the link in our show notes to learn more about how you, yes, you, can begin to haunt the dump, guard vortexes, or even become a scorching Sasquatch. Also in our show notes, you can find the link to our website, more information on our sources, our social media handles, and our merch store. We'd love for you to keep creeping with us. So if you like this episode, please subscribe, rate, review, and share the show with your fellow creeps and or ghosts. I beg of you. (laughs) 